advanced appraisal. And uh, without further ado, he said make it quick because he's got a lot of uh, things to cover. So uh, please welcome James Coleman. Thank you. Welcome, folks. Is it okay if I step away from the mic? Are you guys all good? Yeah. It's a small room. All right. Um, this class begins where most tree appraisal classes end. Right? When you walk into this classroom, I'm expecting that you have all had at least some experience with the trunk formula method or technique. Raise your hand if you have no idea what I'm talking about when I say trunk formula method, trunk formula technique. All right, for those of you who are not familiar with that, you are about to get a crazy crash course in the use of the trunk formula method of appraisal, technique of appraisal. Uh, for those of you who have experience with it, maybe just like help along when we do the classwork activity. Uh, but we're building upon that foundation and uh, we're going to go into areas of appraisal that aren't usually covered in typical one-day appraisal workshops just because there just isn't enough time. Okay, so um, the first thing that I want to do is I just want to lay some foundation just to make sure that you all know where we're at. Uh, after I cover that foundation, we're going to cover a bunch of different methods and techniques that we don't usually talk about in these basic classes. And then um, finally, this is the meat and potatoes of what I want to cover today, is we're going to get to reconciliation, comparing the different techniques, and then finally selecting an answer. And then at the very end, we're going to do um, at least one of the case studies. Now this course used to be, or it still is, I guess, a two-day workshop. Um, and I delivered it once in Vancouver, once in Portland, just in July. Uh, and then I was asked to give the advanced portion of it, day two, as part of this conference. And then I found out that they wanted it in four hours instead of eight hours. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the short, short version. You'll note that um, in the workbooks that I've given you all, the workbooks, workbooks were designed for the full course. So there's going to be some pieces of material that we skip over. I'll point them out to you as we go along. But uh, just suffice it to say that there, there are some things that we're not doing today that are part of the full course that you're welcome to either ask me about later, do outside of course, uh, or uh, as you'd like. Hi there. Oh, please, have a, have a look for And I even have some extras if anybody needs one. All right. Um, so let's First get... question. Oh, bring it on. This is based on the 10th edition? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so let's get some basic foundational stuff. When you're appraising a thing, regardless of whatever it is that you're appraising, whether it's a house, a car, or a tree, there are three approaches that you can take when you go about your appraisal. One is the market approach. What would somebody be willing to pay for this thing that you're appraising, the value of the thing based on prior transactions? We have the income approach. The income approach is um, the present value of the future benefits provided by the thing that you're appraising. And then finally, we have the cost approach. The cost approach is how much resources it would take to recreate or reproduce the thing that we are appraising. Now, within each of these approaches, there's a number of different methods. And in turn, there's a number of different techniques. And we're going to be talking about a number of them. We'll be starting within the cost approach. That's where we're going to start. And the reason for that is usually with sales comparison and the market approach, it's very difficult to apply that to trees, right? People don't buy and sell giant trees very often, so it's kind of difficult to get comparable sales for that. It's possible to do some sales comparison. We're going to talk about sales comparison as a proxy. We'll get to that later, but for the most part, not commonly used. Income approach can be used in an agricultural setting, like if you're saying what's the present value of the future expected peaches I'm going to sell. But for an amenity tree, like a pine tree in Mrs. Jones's front yard, well, it's a little difficult. How do you say what the present value of those benefits are? So again, less commonly used. By far and away, the most commonly used approach to tree appraisal is cost approach. How much resources would be required to recreate, repair, or reproduce the thing that we're appraising? Now, within the cost approach, I need to establish one thing. Cost does not equal value. Cost and value are not the same thing. And this is going to come up a couple of times today. Cost is resources to create. Value is willingness to pay. It is possible that something costs a whole ton of money to create, but nobody's willing to pay for it, which is how it's possible to have a trunk formula method or trunk formula technique appraisal of a $100,000 tree on a $40,000 lot of land. That is possible because it very well could cost a great deal of money to recreate the tree, despite the fact that nobody wants to pay for it. 
So it is perfectly fine to have two completely separate outcomes depending on the approach that you take in the appraisal. All right, so cost does not equal value. Now within the cost approach, there's a number of different methods. I'm gonna go over three of them. Uh, we have reproduction method. We have, oh, I'm sorry, I'll get to that in a sec. Reproduction, functional replacement, and cost of repair. Uh, reproduction, there's this thing in the way I usually go with the whole gambit of the stage. Uh, reproduction asks the question, how much would it cost to create an identical copy of the thing that you're appraising, an identical copy, like for like, same species, same size, same everything. Functional replacement asks the question a little differently. You're asking the question, how much would it cost to put back the benefits provided by the tree? And it may or may not be the same thing. If it's possible to create the benefits in a less expensive way, maybe with a different species that's less expensive, maybe with a smaller tree that's less expensive, but still provides those same benefits, then uh, uh, you would choose the less expensive alternative. Now this is based on what's called the principle of substitution. A thing cannot appraise for more than an item of equivalent utility. I have a whole talk about the principle of substitution. We just, we don't have time to go into it today. But it's basically, you, you do it a bunch of different ways and then you compare and you say, does this provide an equivalent utility, an equivalent, equivalent benefit? If it is, you drop the higher expensive one and then you just pick the less expensive one. If they're not equivalent, you take the one that's not equivalent, you throw that away and then you choose the lowest cost of the remainder. But that, that goes, goes beyond the scope of this talk. We don't have time to get into that. Uh, but I'm just mentioning it that that is one of the methods. And then finally, the last method, which we are going to be talking about a little bit today, is cost of repair. The cost to fix the problem, assuming that the tree will remain in place and continue to provide similar benefits to uh, what it did before whatever partial loss. All right, so those are our approaches. Um, within the reproduction method, we have a number of different techniques. Um, I'm going to be talking about a couple of them today. One is trunk formula technique, by far and away the most commonly used technique of tree appraisal. And that has to do with extrapolating out the reproduction cost of a tree based on nursery stock. Another technique is cost compounding. That's uh, um, extrapolation based on an interest rate. And, uh, um, and then we also have um, a direct replacement technique, which would be, or direct cost technique. That's how much to go find an existing tree somewhere out in the world dig it up, stick it on a flatbed, and bring it to the property and crane it into place. So there's different ways that you can go about doing a, uh, a reproduction method of appraisal, but they're all answering the question, how much would it cost to put back an identical copy of the thing that we're appraising? That's basically what they're all about. So what we're starting with today, that's where the arrow is there, what we're starting with is where we usually leave off, uh, which is the trunk formula technique. Usually you'll learn in these basic classes, you'll learn about um, the basic components of the trunk formula technique, which I'll go over in a moment. Uh, but then it'll just say, here's how to appraise the reproduction cost or the depreciated cost of this tree. And that's the end of the analysis. Well, what we're going to pick up today is we're going to pick up how to deal with partial losses. Partial losses, curable and incurable defects, which I'll be bringing up in a sec. Now, within the trunk formula technique, there are five components, five components that get multiplied together as part of this calculation. We have the size of the tree as measured in trunk cross-sectional area, the unit cost, the dollars per square inch of trunk cross-sectional area, and then we have three depreciation ratings, condition, functional limitations, and external <coughs> limitations. Again, there's like a whole class on this. Hopefully you have familiarity with these terms already. If you don't, you're gonna get a crash course. Condition has to do with the health structure and form of the tree. And uh, um, you're saying, how good of a tree is it? Is it, you know, is it good structure? Is it able to hold itself upright? How's the leaf quality? Is it able to photosynthesize? How's the form, the silhouette of the tree? How's that looking? And you come up with a percentage between zero and 100%. Functional limitations relates to the species and site as they relate to each other. Formerly in the ninth edition, it was the species rating and the location rating. We're still dealing with both species and location, but we're doing it in a different way because we're acknowledging that some species are well suited to some environments and some, that same species might not be well suited to other environments. And just saying across the board that all trees of a certain species are amazing and all trees of another different species are bad, that grossly oversimplifies things. So we, we actually deal with them together. We, we talk about their interaction. Uh, so that's what the functional limitations rating is. And then finally, we have the external limitations, and that's dealing with questions, uh, uh, attributes that are outside the property, outside control of the property owner, things like easements or water restrictions, um, uh, covenants uh, restrictions that say like 
height, maximum height that uh, can be allowed for a tree, like a, a view restriction in some development areas. They say you can't have a tree taller than a certain height. Even if the tree isn't taller than that height today, it's still going to be limited in value because you can never let it grow up to a certain height. Uh, or if you live near an airport, you have something called an avigation easement. They have to have a right of way for the planes to land, which means trees can't be allowed to get over a certain height. All of those would fall under external limitations, something that limits the value of the tree due to a factor that's outside the property, outside the control of the property owner. Okay, so we've just, in these first, what, five minutes of this class, we basically just covered the ground in an entire first day basic tree appraisal workshop. Now we're going to dive in and start talking about um, some of the more advanced stuff. Let's start with um, curable and incurable defects. Okay, so when we, uh, oh, by the way, when you're following along in your workbook, you'll notice that there's a bunch of pages and they're asking things like, what's the population of Japan? There was a whole opener exercise where I talk about um, anchor points and stuff. I just had to skip it in order to fit this all into four hours. But actually, we're, we're going to begin with, uh, let's see, on page nine. That's what we're going to begin with. That's our first exercise. So um, I'm going to introduce the idea of, oh, Anna's coming up for a workbook of her own. Here we go. Uh, I'm going to introduce the. Uh, that's all I got. Okay. Um, wait, wait. I'm glad I brought a few from home. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, not sorry. Okay. So when we when we talk about trees with defects, right? Sometimes a, a tree is going to have a problem. Let's say there was a fire and burned half the canopy, right? Or or uh, let's say a trash truck comes and bashes off a trunk on the tree. But the tree isn't a total loss. You can still salvage this tree. You can still have it hang around. Well, the tree still has some residual value, right? It still has something. It, it's not a total loss, so it's not zero. So we, it, it's got to be between zero and perfect, perfect tree. So where is it? Where does it fall along that line? Well, that's why we have a way of going about appraising trees for partial losses. Now that you can broadly classify defects in a tree as being curable or incurable. Curable means you can do something about it that will fix it, that will undo it. And incurable is something that you just can't put back. It's completely uh, um, uh, unfixable. On a house, if you were dealing with curable or incurable depreciation, you might say, like, uh, if, if you have scratches on the paint on the outside of the house, well, what can you do about that? You can paint the house. You can sand them down and paint the house, right? That's curable depreciation. Maybe the house has less value today because of all the scratch marks on the outside of the house, but you can fix it by just simply sanding it down and painting it. And now that the house has its value again. Um, but on the other hand, with a tree, if you knock off one of its giant branches, and now it's a big one-sided tree, you can't just like wave a magic wand and staple these branches back on. You would say that that's incurable. It's not fixable. All right, so that would be the primary difference between, that's the big idea, the, the difference between curable and incurable depreciation. The way you go about appraising trees with curable or incurable depreciation is going to differ. With incurable depreciation, you simply apply depreciation. You apply depreciation. You say the, tr the tree is now less valuable as a result of the presence of this defect. So you'll appraise it and you'll penalize that condition rating, for example. Whereas before, maybe it was an 80 or a 90% condition rating. Now that it's had it, half its canopy burn, you'll give it a 40% or a 30% condition rating. And, it, and, and, and in doing so, what you're doing is you're implying, well, I can't put it back, right? It's been depreciated. Um, it's lost a portion of its value. Now, let's say if in your professional opinion, it actually is fixable or partially fixable. Well, then what you do is in your mind's eye, you imagine, you imagine it's already been fixed. Whatever it is that you've recommended, whether it's if it's a pest uh, uh, infestation, you've already applied the insecticide and given the tree an opportunity to respond. If it's a, um, a burned section of a tree, but you believe that with proper care it could re-sprout in a certain way, you imagine it's already re-sprouted. In your mind's eye, you imagine that it's already been fixed. And then what you do is you apply depreciation to that imaginary tree and then subtract out the cost of fixing it, the cost of applying whatever treatment you're recommending. Right, so here we're just applying the depreciation if it's incurable. Here, if it's curable, you imagine what it's like if it's already fixed. You apply that depreciation, which is usually a less, less of a penalty. It's usually a better condition rating. And then you subtract out the cost of repair. Good? We all head nods on that one? 
All right, now we're going to do. Oh, yes, please. Uh, with regards to incurable defect, um, as far as assessing the value of the treat, doesn't that take into consideration the potential risk uh, based on what happened with that um, with that defect? Potentially. So, so let's say you're concerned about the structural stability of the tree after tr um, trash truck bashes off a half of the tree. Now you're concerned that because it's one-sided, it's more likely to fail. Well, you'd incorporate that into your structure rating and the condition rating. Does that make sense? Yes. So it's something that you can take into account. However, it's worth noting that an appraisal is not a risk assessment. It is possible for a tree to pose a high risk and still have an appraised value of some non-zero number. It is possible to have that. And then you would simply, in your reconciliation phase, say, well, yeah, it may cost a whole ton of money to recreate this tree, but that's not the most appropriate method of appraisal. It's not the most appropriate technique of appraisal because, in my opinion, I recommend removal for the tree, and therefore, the appraised value is zero. You don't deal with it in the formula. You deal with it in the reconciliation phase. So I will actually handle that in great depth when we get to reconciliation towards the end of the day. Excellent question. Uh, for those of you who just come, I think I have like one more packet for you up front if you want to come and grab it. Alrighty. All right, so let's, uh, let's work through our first example. Does anybody need a pen or a pencil? Raise your hand if you need a pen or pencil. I don't have them, but maybe you can share with your neighbors or something. Uh, <laughs> okay, so we're going to um, appraise this tree right here after this failure occurred. So it was formerly two trunk tree. We had an 18 and a 21 inch tree, uh, uh, trunks. This one failed. It's been cleaned up already. We're imagining in our mind eye, this has already been cleaned up. And what we're doing is we're appraising this remaining portion using the trunk formula technique. That's the idea. Is this curable or incurable? incurable. This is very, this is textbook incurable. Ain't scotch taping this back together, right? incurable defect. There is something that we just can't fix about this tree as much as we'd like to believe. So very simply, we're just going to apply depreciation, right? So now um, on page 10, you will see a chart that outlines the trunk formula technique appraisal that we're going to be doing together. You note, pre-loss, a competent and accurate trunk formula technique appraisal has been performed for you, and you're going to assume all of the data in this first column to be correct and accurate. Maybe you personally disagree with some of the ratings. Just play along for purposes of this classroom activity. We're going to be asking the questions, um, which one of these attributes is affected by the loss of this failure, and then come up with a subsequent calculation to see how we do. So in order to do this, um, uh, this image for your reference is just, you go back to page nine, you can look at the image. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this off the screen and I'm going to pull up an Excel sheet so we can fill it out to together. Sound good? Yep. Okay. Bear with me. I'm not familiar with this computer. <coughs> this is the computer that we are using for this. Is it working? Good. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. Oh, it looks like it's already been filled out for us. So we're gonna, <laughs> I'm going to delete all of these. Now you can. It is possible for us to come up with different answers, so don't don't use these as anchor points. Uh, blah blah blah. Okay. All right. All right. First things first. We have an 18 and a 20 inch trunk. Okay. So looking at that first row, say DBH. Uh, in the post-loss appraisal of this tree, the 20-inch trunk is gone. Okay, so what would we use for our DVH on this tree? 18, right, and so we have that right there, 18 inches. So now the trunk cross-sectional area is pi over 4 times the diameter squared, which gives us 201 square inches. Raise your hand if you are not familiar with this calculation. Okay, all right. So when we do the calculation for the trunk cross-sectional area, we, we take the diameter, line two, squared, divided by four, times pi. And that gives you the cross-sectional area of the, the trunk. And then we'll multiply that by the unit cost, the dollars per square inch of nursery stock. So now tell me, uh, in this next line over here, it says unit cost. So it says $54 a square, a square inch. Uh, does the failure of that trunk change how much it costs to buy trees in the nursery? No. no, it doesn't. So it remains the same. The unit cost remains the same before and after the loss. Yes? Yeah. Okay, good. Why is this one 63? Why is this one? Why is it 63? Let's change it. 54. 
And where do you get 54? Uh, you, well, what you can do is you can look it up in your regional guide, or you Our 15-year-old regional guide? Or, <laughs> you know, 2007 is one of the most recent regional guides that I know of. So actually, a word on that, because I think it's worth talking about. So um, when the ninth edition came out, it recommended that we create our PACs, Regional Plant Appraisal Committees, uh, and they were responsible for gathering regional data from around the different chapters for how much it costs to produce nursery stock. They gather that together, and they put it in a handy little booklet, and the PNW chapter most recently published theirs in 2007. My home chapter, the Western chapter, published theirs in 2004. These are the most recent consensus documents that we have on this data. One valid argument is, because it's the most recently published document in our chapter, that is the number that we use. And many people, you li they look it up, that's the number. That's totally fine. In other cases, very true, your concerns are valid. It's out of date. Prices ain't the same as they used to be back in 2007, 2004, 98 if you're in Pendel chapter. The idea is that things have changed. So one of the things that you can do is you can pick up the phone and start calling a couple of nurseries. Or you can look up on some nursery pricing websites and you can actually get catalogs online and just look up pricing. And it's, it's actually not too bad these days. I've been able to find lots of nursery data just published freely online. So if you want a quick and dirty way, you pull out your PNW guide, even though it's a little old, flip to the number, and that's the number you use. Or you can call up the nursery and do your own nursery research. Um, it takes a little more time, it takes a little more research, but if you do that, it's going to give you more uh, uh, current contemporary pricing. It's Excellent question. It's a little more defensible. Absolutely. That's right. Well, it depends. It depends on the scope of the assignment. Much like the difference between a level one and a level two risk assessment, Sometimes it's just not called for to walk all the way around the tree if you're doing 10,000 trees along the utility lines. Sometimes you just want to walk along and get some quick and dirty information. And that could potentially be true if you're appraising a whole ton of trees and you just need to look up some numbers really quickly. On the other hand, if you're dealing with a single tree in a highly contentious litigation, well, maybe you want to take the time and research. Have a little bit more of a defensible result. Excellent question. I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, so there's our unit cost. Um, how about our basic cost calculation? Well, we can see that when we multiply the trunk area, 201 square inches, times $54 a square inch, we get $10,854. You're welcome to copy that down into your basic cost. That's the white box right there. Okay, let's move down onto health. As a result of the failure of that trunk, has the health, the tree's ability to photosynthesize and so forth, <coughs> has that changed after the failure? Fair. All right. So before the failure, a competent tree appraiser assessed the health rating as 80%, which is on the high end of good. Uh, or the, the, no, yes, yeah, the high end of good. Um, uh, if we feel like the health rating has changed, everybody starts shouting out some subsequent health ratings that you might give for the remaining portion of this tree. Just start shouting out. 40%. 40. 30. 30. I'm not hearing everybody. 45. 60. 60, 70. All right, all right, okay, so we've got them all over the place. Uh, uh, some were penalizing it more heavily. I bet you that when you get to structure and form, maybe you penalize it a little less. The folks that penalize it less here, maybe you're thinking the health, not so bad, but the structure, you dock it a little bit more. I think that's usually how it ends up working when I, I, I've taught this class before. For purposes of this exercise, we're just going to use 50. But um, uh, I, I respect your opinions, um, and I think that any of those numbers are totally valid. Yes? What's the species of the tree? What's the species of the tree? It's an ash tree. <coughs> so that's, no, that's an excellent question. It's kind of important to know whether it's able to uh, create response growth um, after that portion of the tree has failed. Uh, and then some people are saying, oh, ash, oh, man. You know, emerald ash borer is almost here. I think it is in Oregon now, isn't it? Right? Yes. Yeah. All right, um, structure. Okay, so again, we're assuming that a competent tree appraiser did this, and he rated it 60%, presumably because of the codominant stem defect. Now, that codominant stem defect has failed, <laughs> right? So what are we going to say for our structure rating? Now, this one's a thinker. What kind? Do we think that the structure rating of the tree has changed as a result of the failure? Valid question. What do we think? I'm seeing some head nods. All right. So what kind of a number do we think might be appropriate for the structure rating? 40%. 40. 40. 30. 30. Okay. 40, 30. Oh, we're all kind of in the ballpark. All right. All right. 
Go with 40, but 30 is totally fine. Um, how about form? Form referring to the, um, the silhouette of the tree. Uh, generally, the form rating uh, comes from a landscape architecture perspective. Um, again, we're assuming that the uh, a competent um, assessor, appraiser, did this uh, ahead of time and called it a 70% before the failure. But now half the tree is gone, and like the canopy is all on one side. How might we rate this? Well, first of all, let me ask the question. Has the form changed? Yeah. Yes. I think it's fair to say the form has changed. What percentage rating are we going to assign to it now? 30. 25, 30, 35, those are all good numbers. Let's go with 30. All right. Now, the easy thing to do would be to just take an average of those, to say, oh yeah, 50 plus 40 plus 30 divided by 3, get 40%, we're done. But that's not the only way to combine those components of the condition rating, is it? That's not the only way. There's another way. <coughs> What's the other way? Well, actually, there's two other ways. We can weight them. Yeah. Or what's the other one? We can take the? What? Oh, uh, if we're just combining these oh. three, how do we, um, there are three ways we can combine them. One is to take an average, one is to take a weighted average, and one is to take the? Mean. Mode. Mean, median, mode. How about the lowest one? So we're dealing with depreciation, right? We're dealing with depreciation, detractors from the condition of the tree, something that makes the tree be suboptimal. Is it possible for a tree to have perfect structure and yet be dead? Yep. Is that possible? Oh, yeah. Sure. So but one of the problems with the condition rating back in the ninth edition was it had a rigid set of four categories, or actually eight categories rated on a four-point scale. You had. Uh, Root structure, root health, trunk structure, trunk health, scaffold structure, scaffold health, branch health, foliage and buds health. And it was theoretically possible for a dead tree to appraise for a fairly high condition rating. And it kept turning out very strange answers for us appraisers. And we said, well, this, this doesn't make any sense. So the 10th edition came around and we recognized, well, actually, it is possible for one or more of these attributes of the condition rating to be dispositive of the condition. It's possible to have a perfect structure rating and the health be zero, representing a dead tree, and then our condition rating would accordingly be zero. So what we do is we said we can either do a straight average, we can do a weighted average, or we can take the lowest one. In this set of circumstances, what do you think is the most appropriate way to proceed? I would take the yeah, lowest. The lowest. Lowest? Lowest? I'm hearing some consensus on lowest one, right? I'm seeing some head nods. Is that fair? I think there's an argument for any one of them. I think there is an argument, but I'm hearing consensus. So all I'm doing is parroting what I'm seeing from you. OK, great. So let's go with the lowest one. Let's say 30%. 30% condition post failure. Now ask yourself, gut check, gut check. If you were to walk up to this tree and see a one-sided canopy with a recently failed predominant stem on this street tree, if you were to look at that and just kind of like intuitively come up with a condition rating, do you think 30% is in the ballpark? No. No? Too high? Too low? Too high. Too high. All right, you would have gone lower. What would you have said? 10%. 10%. Okay, so you're feeling like this tree is really not so great. Okay. I can't rely on the track guy later on to do the right thing. You can't. Oh, you're saying you can't rely on the track guy? Yeah, I can't, I can't wait for somebody else to say this is too much of a risk. I need to be the person that condemns this tree. Oh, well, that's not the scope of the work we're doing. Right now, we're assigning a reproduction cost to the tree. If you were asked the question, what's the risk posed by the tree, by all means. If you were a manager of the tree and you were deciding whether to condemn it, by all means. But if the assignment is cabined just to assigning a monetary value to the tree, that's going outside of the scope. And I would say that that would be an inappropriate reason to do the deduction that you're referring to. It's perfectly fine if, you, in your opinion, you think the tree is in worse condition. That's fine. But if the reason you did it was because you want them to remove it, that's not okay. Good? Okay. All right, moving on. All right, uh, functional limitations. Now we're talking about species and its interaction with the site. Has the species of the tree changed as a result of the failure? No. I have to ask, I know it sounds obvious, but I have to ask that question. Has the site of the tree changed as a result of the failure? No. no. Okay. Has the interaction of the species and site changed as a result of the failure? Yes. yes. Well, maybe. No. Help me out. Like if there's a prevailing wind coming okay. towards the remaining stem, yep. like that could be a potential. It sounds an awful lot like what you're describing is structure, which would be most appropriately placed under the condition rating. Does that make sense? What if you had like severe sidewalk lift or like infrastructure?
Good. Damage. 